Well, this morning we are continuing in our series that we started last week uh, called Memoirs of Moses. We're going to spend the next 12 weeks uh, looking at the life of Moses. Um, and I'm really um, excited for this. And so um, this morning I want to pick up the story of Moses. I want to look at a couple different aspects of his life, a couple moments in Moses' life specifically. And as I was preparing and, and thinking of Moses, it, what came to mind was this joke that's going around right now. And it's, you, you see it on the internet, you hear about it. John Krasinski in his Some Good News makes a joke about it. It's, it's all over. And it's the fact that with the virus, Almost everybody is working from home, we're on Zoom calls, we're on Zoom meetings, pastors are coming to you virtually, some of them coming from their own homes. And with this comes the fact that most of the time, we only see the top half of people. You know, you tune in to, to the meeting and make sure your hair looks good, your face looks good, and you got a nice shirt on, but it doesn't matter what sweatpants you have on, it doesn't matter if you have shorts on, doesn't matter. We only see the top half. And in the life of Moses, I think this is often how we regard him. We think of Moses as this man who God did mighty things through him, and, and he did. But Moses also wasn't perfect, like the man or the, the pastor on, on the meeting, you know, who's real dressed up on top. Moses has a not-so-dressed-up lower half. Moses has, an, we could even say, an ugly part of him that we oftentimes don't look at. And so this morning, I want to take some time and look at three moments from the life of Moses specifically. And I think we're going to be encouraged um, and built up. And, and so I'm really excited for that this morning. I want to begin in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 20. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 20. At this point in, in the book of Acts, Jesus Christ has already come as a man, and he's lived his perfect life, died on the cross, he's come back to life, and he's ascended to be back up with the Father. At this point, we see the church beginning to spread. The book of Acts recounts really the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, we meet a man, an apostle, a follower of Christ, a leader in the church named Stephen. And Stephen at this point is about to be stoned because of his testimony, and because of the things that he's doing. Before he's stoned, though, he gives a sermon to the high priests and to all those in attendance. He recounts the history of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament. And we meet him in, uh, in Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, where he gives us a little bit of an overview of the life of Moses. So would you read, it, read with me? Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 20. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. He was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they didn't understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, your brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. We see here the beginning of Moses' life. D.L. Moody, speaking of the life of Moses, um, says, says this. He says that Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was a somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was a nobody. And he spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Stephen, as he continues on in this sermon recounting Israel's history and specifically the life of Moses, he reveals that Moses had three distinct segments of his life. The first part, where Moses thinks he's a somebody. He's somebody great. The second 40 years, 
where he learns that he's a nobody. In the third 40 years, where he discovers what God can do with a nobody. Chuck Swindoll, speaking of this, has some really poignant words here. Chuck says, You and I, though we may never achieve the age of 120, live in one of those three stages at this very moment. We either think we're somebody or we have advanced enough to realize we are nobody or we have finally discovered what God can do with a nobody. Every single one of us may take an honest evaluation of ourselves. And we are in one of these three stages in our life. We either think that we are somebody great, that God owes us something, and that because of what we have, God is going to use us. We either are learning that we are a nobody, and that it's only through God working in us that we can do things for his kingdom. Or we have discovered that, and we are discovering what he can do through a nobody. Now, as we pick up the life of Moses, we see here that he spends his first 40 years thinking that he's a somebody. And, and it makes sense, honestly. You know, we see here, as Stephen is recounting Moses' life, we see that he was born at a time where the Pharaoh was afraid that the Israelites were getting too powerful. The Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians at this point. The Pharaoh is the leader of the Egyptians, and he sees that the Israelites, their numbers, they're becoming too many of them. So he decides every baby boy, every Israelite baby boy, is to be killed to make the Israelites not as strong. And Moses is born into this. And God, through his divine working, protects him. And at the age of three months... His mother and his sister put him in a basket, put him out right as the Pharaoh's daughter is out. And she comes across him and through God's divine working, decides to take Moses as her son. So then Moses spends the first 40 years of his life as the Pharaoh's grandson, essentially. He has everything he could ever want, everything he could ever need. He has it all. He's the ruler's grandson. He grows up in the palace. And so he begins to think that he's somebody great. He begins to think that he's important. And as we continue on through his life, we see that when he was 40 years old, he happens, he saunters out one day and sees his people, the Israelites, who are the slaves of the Egyptians at this point. He sees one of them being mistreated. And so he goes up to the Egyptian that's mistreating the Israelite and he looks both, he beats him, he looks both ways and he kills the Egyptian. Moses wanted to see his own people, the Israelites, not in slavery anymore. So he decides because he thinks he's somebody to do something great. His anger wells up, he kills a man and then the next day comes back and finds out that some people saw him do this, and he flees to the desert. And the thing here is that, did the taskmaster, the Egyptian, did he deserve to be punished for mistreating the Israelite? Yeah, he did. And was it wrong for him to beat the Israelite? It, yes, it was. But Moses, in this moment, his, because he thinks his, so, he's somebody, he allows his anger to kill the Egyptian. He was energized by the flesh because he wanted to do something. He was not living by the Spirit at that point. Chuck Swindoll says it's one thing to do the will of God, but it is another thing entirely to do the will of God in God's time. Moses got tired of waiting on God to deliver his people. So he jumps in and thinks that he can solve this problem. He rushed God's timing because he was tired of waiting. And I've noticed this pattern in myself that when I think I'm somebody, though I've never killed anybody, when I think I'm somebody, I treat others like they're nobody. When I think I'm great, I don't, I don't care about other people. And I think 
many of us can, can relate to this. When we're driving down the road and that person cuts out in front of us going 10 miles an hour below the speed limit, all of a sudden in our mind, that person goes from this person who has value because they're made in God's image to that idiot, how dare they do that? I deserve to get where I'm going when I'm going to get there. Maybe you can relate to this. this. This happened to me in the midst of the virus, the stay-at-home order. I was at the grocery store, and I just needed a couple things. And so I walked down the bread aisle, and I see the person in front of me taking the last loaf of bread. And in that moment, I, I didn't kill the person, but that person became a nobody in my mind. I was like, how dare they? I deserve that bread. I deserve that. They, they don't, I don't care about them. Because when we think we're somebody, we devalue other people. We don't care about them. And in Moses, because of his anger, he descended with him killing the man. I told you we're going to look at some ugly parts in the life of Moses. So at this point, Moses decides to flee. He runs to the desert. In Acts chapter 7, if we continue on to the next verse where we ended in verse 30, it says that after Moses had fled, now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness. So we see that Moses, he spent 40 years in the desert. He spends the first 40 years in the palace thinking he's a somebody. He spends his second 40 years in the desert learning that he's a nobody, as D.L. Moody says. And 40 years is a long time. I'm 23 years old. And that's almost double my life he spends leaving what he knows. He grows up in the palace where he has everything he wants and needs, and he can get anything he wants to the desert where all of a sudden he's a shepherd, shepherding animals. Life, life isn't great. And in this moment, in these years, God begins to mold him and to shape him. This desert, he left everything that he knew to an uncomfortable life where he had very little. And I think many of us can relate to Moses right now. We feel as if we are in a desert. We've left what we've known as comfortable. We've left what we, the routines we've fallen into. And we find ourselves in a desert of social distancing, a desert of a stay-at-home order, a desert of physical distance from our loved ones, a, a desert of only being able to see our immediate family, a desert of sorrow from losing loved ones, the people that we know. And this is not to minimize these times and to minimize the hurt because the hurt and the loneliness and the anxiety is real. But I want you to consider as Moses in the desert was being molded by God. Are you, what is God trying to teach you in this moment, in this time? In the desert, Moses chose to look to God to be his guidance. He allowed God to work in him. And this is the thing. The person who still thinks there's somebody great seeks to guide themselves when they, find them, when they find themselves in a desert. If you think, this is how you know if you think you're still somebody. If you are looking to yourself for guidance, if you think you can just try hard enough to get through this, if you think that if you read your Bible more, you can get back to where you were with God, if you think that the loneliness you feel, you can get by it by trying harder, if you can comfort your family better by just trying harder, you're looking to yourself for guidance in this time. I want to encourage you to look to Christ to be your guidance. The person who is learning that they're nobody looks to Christ to be their guide when they find themselves in a desert. And you might say, why would I look to Christ? What does he know about a desert? In Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, born to the Virgin Mary, he lived a perfect life. And before his three years of ministry began, he spent 40 days fasting and praying in the, in the physical desert. He spent 40 days being tempted 
He knows what it's like to be in a desert. But then even from there, Jesus' entire earthly life, he was in a, a desert of being rejected. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be alone because in his humanity, he felt all of these things. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood because Jesus in his entire life, until he died and came back to life, was misunderstood. They didn't understand why he was actually here. So look to Christ to be your guide in this time. If you don't know what that looks like, the scriptures tell us, if you've never made this decision, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you've never made that decision, today's the day. Look to Christ to be your guide in this time. He knows what it's like. He's been there. And for those who have made that decision and are followers of Christ. Continue to fix your eyes on Christ. Continue to allow him to guide you and to teach you and to mold you in this time. He's been there. He knows what it's like. And Moses made the decision to look to God, to mold him and to shape him so that he could be used by him. Now, Moses, though he had learned that he's a nobody, the messy parts, the ugly parts of him still show up. I want to take us to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. We're, gonna, we're sticking here in the life of Moses. We're going back to the Old Testament here, to the original account of it. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 15. We meet Moses here where He's in the final stage of his life. He's gone from thinking he's a somebody to learning he's a nobody in the desert to now discovering what God can do with a nobody. And Moses, at this point, has done some really, really amazing things. God has done some amazing things through him. Moses has led, has led the people out of Egypt, out of their slavery, and to the wilderness. Moses, at this point, is going up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God. The Ten Commandments and, and other laws as well. But while he's up there, they've been wandering for, for, for years at this point, the Israelites have, with Moses and Aaron as their leaders. Moses is up there for a while, and the people decide that they don't know if Moses is ever going to come back. They're like, he's been up there too long. They choose to, to forget that Yahweh has led them out and they, choose, they decide that they're tired of worshiping this God that they can't see and they think Moses isn't ever going to come back. And so they tell Aaron, hey, we, we want a God that we can see, a God that we can worship. And so Aaron takes their gold, melts it, and they make a golden calf and they begin to worship this golden calf. They choose to forsake Yahweh and all that he's done for them in delivering them because they want a God that they can see. We pick up the story here where Moses is coming down. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. These are the Ten Commandments. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, It is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Moses comes down here to see that the people have made a God of their own to worship. And we once again see Moses' anger. And there's an aspect of his anger that is righteous, but it's what he does with his anger that becomes the ugly, pardon me, sinful, disobedient part of him. We see that Moses takes the tablets the only written words of God at this point, the Ten Commandments, and he throws them. And he takes the golden calf and he grinds it up and puts the powder in water and forces the people to drink it. 
This is not righteous anger. There's an aspect of it, but this is out of control anger. We see in chapter 34, verse one, that the Lord isn't exactly pleased with Moses. Exodus 34, one, immediately after this, the Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first ones, which you broke. God didn't tell Moses to do that. Moses let his anger get the best of him and acted in this. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. It isn't the anger that's the disobedience. It isn't the anger that's the sin, but it's what we do with it. It's how we act, how we treat others, what we say. And we're in a time right now where it's very easy to get angry with our family members. It's easy to be angry at God. Why would he take away these things? Why would he take away my work and my friends and my family and my grandparents? Why would he take these things away? And I want to encourage you and challenge if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to be angry. But what are we doing with our anger? Are we choosing to sin with it? Like Moses, are we taking these things and throwing a fit and a tantrum and, and throwing? Or are we choosing in our anger to be honest with God about it, to bring it to him? God didn't punish, punish Moses for what he did. He didn't rip into him, but he gently reminded him, you are the one that broke the tablets. He gently called him out. I want to fast forward a couple more years in the life of Moses in the Israelites here. At this point, he's, he's discovering what God can do with a nobody, or with, yeah, with a nobody, but he's still not perfect. In the book of Numbers, just two books over, Numbers chapter 20, the people have been wandering for about 39 years in the desert. They're, they're almost able to go into the promised land the land of Canaan. But they're getting a little, I guess, antsy. We could say they've been wandering for 39 years and, all, and they've been without water for three days. So let's pick up the story here. Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse two. Now there was no water for the congregation. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord? Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grains or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. The people are without water for three days and they begin to get dramatic. They're like, Moses, why did you bring us here to die? It would have been better if we had just died in Egypt, if we had been in slavery. Now, in their defense, I think if I had been without water for three days, I would be a little dramatic too. So Moses intercedes for them. He, he goes to God and in verse 6, we see what Moses and Aaron do. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, pay, pay a good attention here to exactly what God tells Moses in verse 8. He says, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for cattle, for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. So God gives Moses and Aaron some very specific commandments here. And let's see now what Moses does in verse 10. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? He speaks to the people Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice and water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their livestock. God told Moses to speak to the rock. But instead, Moses chose to speak to the people and strike the rock and direct 
disobedience. He's fed up with the people's complaining and their grumbling. In his anger, he decides to rip into them. He calls them, you rebels. And then he strikes the rock instead. This is what he does with his anger. It reminds me of when I was in high school. I uh, was on the basketball team and we were really bad. Um, like really, really bad. And so this one year, we had this coach and the assistant coach, and um, we had just lost a game again really badly. We lost all of our games really badly. And I guess our coaches had had enough of it. So we get to practice the next day. And while we're there, like the beginning of practice, our coaches are just like running us into the ground. And we finish up, and they have us all go in against the wall. They're, they're very, you know, upset at us for how we'd played the day before. And our assistant coach begins to just rip into us. He went off on this profanity-filled tirade, belittling and berating a bunch of teenagers for the way we had played. And I remember looking back, or I'm able to look back now, and I remember just thinking, number one, how hurt I was that somebody in a position of leadership who I looked up to as my coach would do this and to say these things about us. But I also remember thinking kind of how ridiculous they looked. This adult throwing a tantrum in his anger because he was fed up that we had made him look ridiculous the day before. As our coach, in his pride, he was fed up with looking ridiculous because of us. So he rips into us. And I think Moses was like this. In his anger, he got tired of the people's grumbling and tired of their complaining. And through a tantrum, and he, he lights the people up a little bit, calling them, you rebels. And then instead of speaking to the rock, he speaks to the people and he strikes the rock. Moses disobeyed God's direct commandment in that time. He also profaned the name of God. He spit on the name of God by disobeying as their leader. And to, to add insult to injury, the rock was their provision of water. This is a symbol of God's presence. And Moses chooses in his anger to strike it. He takes the glory for himself. In verse 10, he says, speaking of Moses, speaking of himself and Aaron, he says, shall we bring the water for you? He takes the glory that is to be God's for bringing the water out and brings it onto himself. He reverts to his old ways of thinking that he is a somebody. He thinks that he is important. And so he lets his anger out and thinks that these people deserve it and takes what's God's. The glory takes it to himself. At that place, at that time, Moses was God's mouthpiece. He was the one that spoke for God. He was the one that represented God to these people. And it was such a big deal that he did this because he was the representative. We see in verse 12 that because of his actions, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Moses, has been, Moses and Aaron have been leading them for 40 years. And because of their sin, they are not able to lead the people into the promised land. And many of us are God's representative in the places where we frequent the most. At our workplaces, at our schools, at our family gatherings, with our friends. And the warning from Moses here is those places, especially where we are God's representative, we must be very careful how we obey, how we speak, how we react, and what we do with our anger. We have the ability to profane God's name in those places. We must be very careful how we live. And I want to close with this, an observation from the whole life of Moses as we've been looking at him. I want to close with an encouragement and a warning. The encouragement is this. God uses sinful people. As we've seen in the life of Moses, he wasn't perfect. We've seen the ugly, messy 
parts of him. But yet God still used him. God uses sinful people. But then this is the warning. But their disobedience hinders his work through them. In the life of Moses, his disobedience hindered him leading the people into the promised land, hindered his ministry because of his disobedience. So be encouraged that God uses sinful people like you, sinful people like me, to do his work. But when we choose to disobey, what we do with our anger, how we treat others, how we represent God in the places that we go, will hinder what God is going to do through us. When I was in middle school, I had a youth leader that I respect greatly. And this youth leader worked in a factory. Um, there were, he worked with a, a bunch of other people. And, and the factory was a, a, a dirty place with lots of dirty talk and profanity and insults. And it just, it was not as good place. And so he, my youth leader, while working there, made the decision that because he was a representative of God in that place, he made the decision that he wasn't going to cuss, he wasn't going to put people down, he wasn't going to belittle and berate people when he got angry. He chose to be a nobody, to put aside his sin, to put aside his disobedience for the sake of of the gospel. And through this, he, many of his co-workers came up to him and said, why are you this way? Why aren't you like us? And he was able to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with them because of the way that he lived, because of his specific obedience in that place. Moses went from thinking he was a somebody to learning that he was a nobody, to discovering what God can do with a nobody. Where are you and what will you choose today when you find yourself in the desert? Where, what will you choose? Let's pray. God, I thank you for Moses. Thank you for your word regarding him. Lord, I thank you that you desire to use us. Lord, as your vessels, would you use us? Lord, I pray that we would choose to be obedient to you day by day, Lord, so that your glory will be made known in this world to those around us that don't know us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.